knew he was struggling. And then she got a call. I can't do it anymore, he said. I can't do it. She drove to get him and went to his dorm room, which is when she saw how he'd been living. Cody had mentioned to her that he had raised his bed, which she thought meant that he'd converted it into a loft or something to make more space. But that wasn't it. He'd raised it a tiny bit and was sleeping under it in this little space. When I walked in there... And I saw how my son had been sleeping for months and months and months. There were maybe inches, inches from, I, mean, I don't even know how he could have slid under there. It was, the space was so small from the ground to the bottom of the bed. Um, and I realized that was a hiding spot. He wasn't sleeping, he was hiding. Like, that was his version of it, I mean, he was literally hiding. And that's where he was living. And I remember thinking when I saw that, I mean, I said, I said, Cody, this is where you've been sleeping? He said, yeah, Mom. And I, I, I didn't want him to see me get upset, so I walked out of his room, and I broke down because I thought, we're the, he's, he's not going to make it. We're going to lose him. And I don't mean figuratively. We are going to literally lose this kid. We are going to lose him. Cody later said he had thought about killing himself. It seemed like it might be the only way to make this stop. Cody and his mom drove home together. It had been four years at this point. Four years of, as Cody puts it, trying to fix his own brain. Sometime after Cody moves home, his parents tell him there's something they need to talk to him about. They're pretty sure it's a bad idea. They feel like they have to tell him, because if he wants to do it, he needs to decide soon. It involved a court, and not a basketball one. They told Cody, if he wanted to, he could try to sue AJ. It was a long shot. The law doesn't have a good way to deal with cases like this. After all, no one was kidnapped, no money was stolen. Cody says nothing physical ever happened. All they'd done was talk. And in fact, talk about religion, which is specifically protected in this country in the Constitution. Cody's parents had done some research, and the best route seemed to be to sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The legal description of what they would have to show was daunting. The conduct had to be, quote, so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community. If Cody chose to do it, the whole thing could take years. Cody would have to be in a courtroom with he would have to relive the whole thing in detail in public, while an opposing attorney tried to derail him. In the end, he might lose, or put another way, AJ might win. And there wasn't much time to think about it. Cody's birthday was a, was coming in just a couple of weeks, and the statute of limitations was going to run out. So he would need to decide within the next two, two and a half weeks before his birthday. Cody thought about it, and one day before his birthday, he filed the paperwork to go ahead. There was over a year of legal wrangling, but this past September it went to trial. I was there for the beginning of it. Cody had all kinds of worries leading up to it. What if he had made all this up? He said that actually crossed his mind. Or what if, when he told all this to the jury, they thought there was something wrong with him instead of Cody had panic attacks in the days before the trial. It was like he'd slid backward. But he took the stand in front of the jury. The first day I can remember so vividly, we were in my we were in my weight room and Cody's lawyer said this was a case of, quote, secret manipulation and isolation of a young boy. He called what happened psychological torture. I looked at the jury, but they were impossible to read. They sat there totally expressionless. Cody was on the stand for over seven hours. But then his part was done. Would you state your name for Arthur, sir? Arthur Lawrence, Jr. And do you go by AJ? Yes. And here, finally, is AJ. He was neatly dressed, carrying a Bible, and yes, tall, barely fit in the witness stand. I'm 
lower back is killing me. It's tightening up and apologize back. If, if you need more space, we can move those two notebooks and that little table will fold down if that's helpful. Well, I meant like this entire wood. Okay, thing. I can't remember all of them. <laughs> <laughs> How tall are you, sir? 6'6". Six, six. Okay. That's AJ's attorney there. He asked AJ how he'd grown up. I had great parents. Um, mom and dad raised me old-fashioned way. Uh, respect elders, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, uh, private preparatory Christian education, um, pretty cool life. AJ went to college for a bit, said he tried out for the NBA's developmental league but didn't make it, so he became an athletic trainer, often teaching kids. He said families loved him, they were really happy with his work, including Cody's family. It went fantastic, I was, um a little bit shocked of Cody's ability to get things quickly and understand them, especially his vocabulary. Wow. Well, how are his basketball skills when he started with him? He could dribble... I think when I first saw him, the first assessment I did with him, it was he dribbled like the most he was able to dribble consecutively was like three dribbles. He was not <laughs> good. And of course, his lawyer asked about his religious beliefs. When did you first learn about the rapture and the tribulation? <sighs> Sorry, kind of got emotional there. I just remember Miss Ward. Um, I really love that teacher. She introduced me that in Central Assembly in the sixth grade. What about the same age Cody was when AJ started talking to him about religion? One of the big questions I had going into the trial was whether AJ had actually believed all the religious stuff he told Cody. One possibility was that AJ would just say, yes, we talked about the rapture, the Illuminati, RFID chips, all that stuff is real. I was trying to save him. Cody pointed out that if AJ really did believe it all, why wouldn't he just testify to that in court? That is not what AJ said. Cody's lawyer asked AJ about the Illuminati. AJ said yes, he had discussed the Illuminati with Cody, but not as a secret society that ran the world. I discussed it in a context that I do believe that there are fraternities, sororities that will cling together and assist others, and that possibly could be a society that he sees on the internet known as the Illuminati. Of course, in his Skype messages, AJ said something very different. He really seemed to believe in the Illuminati. He wrote, quote, The Illuminati will kill you if you don't do as you're told. Give the system problems and you die or live with their mark. Cody's lawyer also asked about RFID chips. Over Skype, AJ had told Cody that chips cause you to lose mind control. Quote, it's imperative that you know what this chip does, three exclamation points. But on the stand, AJ downplayed that. Didn't say the chips were the mark of the beast. He talked about them like they were just some new technology he'd read about online. I have found a link online. I believe it was done out of the University of North Carolina. And also there was another link out of uh, Alberta, Canada, I believe, that said there's biometric technology. It's here. It'll store your information, et cetera, et cetera, and all your stuff. Uh, would you be surprised if this was interpreted as something different than that by a 14-year-old boy? After all this, <laughs> I'm not surprised now. Uh, I take it you're, by, by the way you're laughing about this, that you think it's funny that this was taken very seriously by Cody at the impressionable age of communicating with him? No. I do take this very seriously. I mean, this is a court of law. What I'm implying, counsel, is before, I didn't really think nothing of this, this Skype or anything, that it can escalate to this level because this Where Cody said they had talked about religion for years, AJ said their conversations had minimal, a matter of hours total. He said when they did talk about religion, it was because Cody had asked. Do you feel like you owe any apologies or any communications you've had with Cody about the subject of this lawsuit? Let's go ahead and just jump to the end of everything. I pondered
included on this, and I'm looking at all of this, and the jury and everybody here, counsel. And I really wish I could turn back the hands of time and take in Mr. and Mrs. Traybig, Cody, to church a lot more so that they can see and they can understand that there are a lot of others in this world, a lot of other Christians that share my same views and opinions about the Bible. So then they wouldn't classify me or label me as being a mean or evil person. This all took place in an old courtroom in Austin. I was struck by the smallness of it. There was basically no one in the audience. Very few witnesses took the stand. Cody, his parents, his therapist, and AJ. The main piece of physical evidence was those Skype transcripts, 25 pages long. This is the system we've come up with for settling disputes between people. We get a bunch of strangers together, a jury, who just have to decide what they think happened and how bad it was. Cody's lawyer, in his closing statement, said they weren't asking for a specific amount of money and damages. But he said Cody's therapist fees had totaled over $76,000. And the jury could add whatever they thought was appropriate for mental anguish. AJ's attorney, in his closing statement, said no one could know for sure why Cody was so strongly affected. Thousands or millions of Americans share AJ's religious beliefs, he said. Why don't we have mental hospitals filled with kids who are terrified of the rapture? The jury, still totally expressionless, recessed on Friday to the parade was what happened beyond all possible bounds of decency. Was it atrocious and utterly intolerable in the civilized community? That evening, I got this voicemail from Cody. Hey, David. This is Cody, and... Wow. Um, we... We won. The, the jury came back unanimous, and I'm just so happy. I want to sing, I want to shout, I want to dance, I'm just, for so long, he was this mythical figure in my life that I couldn't touch. <sighs> it's amazing. And I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. And that's all I can say. There is one thing Cody did not mention in that message. The amount of the judgment. The jury awarded Cody just four dollars in damages. Basically the minimum. One dollar for medical care, one dollar for mental anguish, etc. Which seemed weird. Like they agreed that AJ had done this thing that was beyond all possible bounds of decency. But when it came time to put a dollar figure on that, their answer was four dollars. We talked to five members of the jury after the trial, so I can tell you what happened. The presiding juror, who they picked to lead the discussion, and who happens to be a judge in real life, told me they started with a quick vote to see where everyone stood. Seven jurors were yeses, ready to hold AJ liable. Three were undecided, and two were noes. So they debated and read through the Skype transcripts, and they took another vote. Ten yeses, two undecideds, both of them men. The presiding juror told me two things seemed to win over the last two. One was the mothers on the jury, who just kind of went to town. And the other was this idea of awarding just four dollars in damages. And everyone kind of liked that idea. For some, it was a way to acknowledge that maybe AJ hadn't known the harm he was causing. Legally, they only had to determine that his behavior had been reckless, not necessarily intentional. It seemed to some of the jurors that AJ actually believed the stuff about RFID chips and all that. But for a lot of the jurors, the $4 was a way to help Cody put this behind him. Cody's family didn't need any money. And they figured if they picked a large dollar amount, yes, that would punish AJ. But he probably wouldn't be able to pay it which would just drag this whole thing out. More legal stuff, maybe AJ would appeal, and everyone would have to go through this whole thing again. So, $4. I'm not sure that's how the jury was supposed to think about things, but it's what they did. After the trial, some of the jurors hugged Cody or came over to talk. One told me he also tried to find AJ to say good luck, but he'd already left. As I said, 
After the trial, AJ did finally agree to talk to us. Hey, David. Is this AJ? This is he. The thing I was most interested in was, what was it all about? Why did he say all that stuff to Cody? But in our conversation, AJ basically denied saying those things. He said Cody made it all up or exaggerated. He told me he stood by everything he said in court, 100%, and he's planning to appeal the ruling. So I took a different approach. Forget about what he said or didn't say to Cody. Did he believe those things? Somehow in court, no one had asked him that simple question. Uh, so can I ask you about RFID chips? Like, in court, it seemed like you were saying you viewed RFID chips as just some new piece of technology to store data about you, and that you'd sent Cody a link to some new story. But then in the Skype transcripts, Cody writes, what did he do to your body? And you write, you lose mind control. And also, you have this whole discussion with him about what to do if his parents make him get an RFID chip implanted. Like, so, so which is it? Do you think RFID chips are just little computer chips, or do you think they're the mark of the beast that the Illuminati want to implant in everyone? How familiar are you with radio frequency? If you're in broadcasting, you should know quite a bit. So tell me, tell me something about radio frequencies. <laughs> tell me something that's useful here about radio frequencies. Well, the thing about it is you're interviewing me. I'm not interviewing you. I'm not here to educate you about radio frequencies. No, I'm just asking you a question. You, you seem to say that there's something important I should know about radio frequencies that would help me understand this. So. Well, let's, let's start off with what they are. Radio frequency identification is what it is, okay? You have a credit card probably in your pocket, and it has a chip in it. Yeah, so is that all you think it is? Do you think it's the mark of the beast also? And that's something the Illuminati want to implant in everybody and will control your mind? Do you believe that? Well, first of all, in a court of law, that's, I would object to that. It's called compounding, okay? okay? Well, do you... So if you're going to ask me a question... Okay. I mean, ask me a specific... Do you believe... Words in my mouth and don't leave me. Okay. Do you I'm believe... Sure I really wish you wouldn't do that. Do you believe RFID chips are or could be the mark of the beast? Uh, I believe that it could be a potential prequel to uh, the mark of the beast based upon what it says, what it states in scripture. I told AJ what the experts told me, that this seemed like a one-on-one -on -one cult. He said he's not part of any cult. like the court case had put some final piece of this thing behind him. It was like Cody had gotten over his fear of the rapture of the Illuminati, but he still had a much more ordinary fear. He was afraid of a person. But in court, AJ did not seem supernatural. He seemed very human. You look at him and you say, you're just a guy. You're just a, no a person. Is part of why this was so powerful for you that uh, you lived for so long with this totally other version of how the world was. And here's a time where you finally decided what is real. And now you've shown it to a bunch of other people. In this, in this very setting where we are supposed to decide what is real and what happened. And they said yes. That's exactly <laughs> That's exactly it. You look back and you just can't believe. The, you can't believe that the things you're saying actually happened. It's crazy stuff to me now. It's crazy stuff and then it happened to you it's it's like it's 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 weird i think those are the words of a fly finally looking at the bottle from the outside david castabal he's the senior editor of our show Alexandra Stein, Joe Sephard, Daniel Valix, Julia Plouffe, Luke Quintet, Marco Gonzalez, Clayton Hoover, Gabriel Marquez, and Kelly King. Our website, thisamericanlife.org. This American Life is delivered to public radio stations by PRX, the public radio exchange. Support of This American Life comes from Progressive Insurance, offering its home quote explorer. So shoppers can evaluate options in one place while buying home insurance. 
custom quotes and rates available online. Learn more at progressive.com for constant contact with email marketing, websites, online stores, and other resources committed to helping small businesses and nonprofits stay connected and do more business online. Learn more at constantcontact.com. And from Odoo, Odoo is a fully integrated business management software solution designed to help run your company efficiently. To learn more, go to odoo.com slash life. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash life. Thanks as always to our program's co-founder, Mr. Tony Malatia. You know, he always gets so sad when he sees a garden gnome. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. I'm Eric Glass. Back next week with more stories of this American life. Support for KQED comes from Simplis, the mortgage lender whose technology searches over 50,000 offers to deliver the right refinance options. Private data stays private with Simplis. More information at simplistnpr.com. Snap Judgment is coming up next, but right now we get to go to traffic and take a look at what's happening in Los Gatos. It's Roy Lamella. Southbound 17, right before Lark Avenue, we have a two-car crash blocking the right lane that has traffic backed up solid from Camden Avenue. The Bay Bridge lower deck, right before Treasure Island, get reports of wood and metal in the right lane, along with the tire in the third lane from the left. It's also a stalled vehicle over to the right lane that's causing some minor delays to the area. I'm Roy Lamella for KQED. Thank you, Roy, and traffic support comes from European Sleepworks. On Beth Heisinger, we have high wind today and expected tomorrow as well. Sunshine all the way to the coast. Daytime highs mid-50s to mid-60s. It's KQED San Francisco and KQEI North Highland, Sacramento. The time now is 1 o'clock. President Biden says his administration will make an announcement Monday on Saudi Arabia after yesterday's release of a U.S. intelligence report that concluded Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman approved the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. NPR's Ron Elving says while the findings aren't new, the release could mark a shift in U.S. policy. The Trump administration was pursuing an ever closer relationship with the Saudis and especially and particularly MBS. And that had a lot to do with arms sales and Israel. So the report was not released and there was a general refusal to acknowledge the known facts. Now the new administration is making more of the reports public, but still not doing much about it, at least not yet. The White House says we should stay tuned. The FDA is expected to clear Johnson and Johnson's COVID vaccine for emergency use this week. An advisory panel unanimously approved it yesterday. NPR's Amy Held reports it would inject millions of doses into the nation's supply as soon as next week. Johnson & Johnson has committed to 100 million doses under its contract with the federal government, but won't deliver until the end of June. The company says it has just 4 million doses.